Good morning, everyone. So we have a wonderful sound person in the back who's Jeff Tonak. And he sits behind the scenes, always making everything sound wonderful and giving me a mic and giving our speakers the headsets. And so I said to him, so what mic am I going to be on today? He said, do you even need a mic, Cheryl? <laughs> well, so do I need a mic? No. Yes. Obviously not. For the online. <laughs> we are glad that you all are here today, and, and we're welcome to you that are online, too. Just want to let you know that we are a mask-free zone now, and um, we have our chairs and everything back together. So, whatever, what? It's not mask-free. Ma oh, excuse me, max op mask optional. So anyway, you don't have to wear a mask anymore when you come to Compass, so just want to let you know that. And we have all our chairs back together, so it's really wonderful. And from a leadership standpoint up front here and singing, it's so great to be able to see everybody's faces now, so that's extra special. We have a men's Bible study group that is meeting on Thursdays now at 6 p.m. here at the church. So all you men that would like to do that, you're welcome. Also, all of our Sabbath school classes are meeting from birth to 12th grade, and we have places around the church where those are meeting. We also have an adult Sabbath school class that just started a week ago that's meeting in the youth building over there. So you can go to that too if you'd like. And we are having a baby shower for our precious Christy and her little boy Nathaniel um, May 8th from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Sutherland Barn. And Christy's made a special request asking that we, uh, that, that anybody that attends brings a book, a baby book that you have liked that you raised your kids on, or if you don't have that, go ahead and buy a special baby book that you like, and you can sign your name in it, and every time she reads that to her precious little boy, she can be re reminded of that sweet gift along with any other gift that you might want to give her. She is registered at Walmart, Target, and uh, Amazon. So if you'd like to get a gift for her, we can do that and welcome her and her little boy. Also, James and Carrie have a homeless ministry. As you all know, uh, the homeless are, have been on our property and stuff, so we're trying to see how we can make this a, a positive experience for them. So next Sabbath, James and Carrie are um, going to have a meeting with whomever is interested right after church, and lunch will be provided, and it's going to be in the youth building back over there. So that way everybody can meet and chat and we can address that. Um, also, we are collecting, well, we're not collecting, but if you would like to donate to Cheryl Holmes, uh, Cheryl Holmes lost her husband, Gerald, a few weeks ago, and you can donate to our best uh, bank, and it's called a care account under Gerald Home, or you can take money and put it in a tithe envelope in the back and put it under giving and specifically address it for Cheryl Home to just help her with the expenses of the funeral and that kind of thing. Also, the youth are having a drama. The, the OAA youth are doing drama and the home show tonight at 6.30 and 8. Is it 8.30? Where is she? Yeah, 8.30. Li doing a live stream of that, too. So if you all would like to enjoy that, you can see that, too. The drama, so. the drama is excellent. Okay. Sorry, so, just a plug. No, but there's a plug, too. So. I don't get well, any money for making once those again, kinds of Once well, again, welcome, and we're glad you all are here. Thank you. to invite you to stand if, as we continue to praise the Lord today. I raise a hallelujah 
in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the
all the little ones please come forward. We have a special children's story for you. beautiful group of kids we have. Of course, we got the most fantastic kids around, don't we? Including the kids in the back there. My story, I usually, they usually tell me what their topic is about so I can gear my story to the topic. But this time I didn't get a text. I couldn't find anything. So I know it's about the Holy Spirit. So I decided to pray about it. And I asked God, I said, please give me a story that will go with what the teaching is. Because I forgot about it until yesterday morning. And I was driving by a church and I was thinking about, I went, I got the children's story this week. I've got to think of, okay, Lord, you know a good story. I know you do. Just bring to my mind a good story. Well, I'm going to tell you about somebody you already know, me. When I was in college a few years ago, okay, wasn't that close, but anyway, a few years ago, I was taking an English class, and it was American literature. And you know what we had to do? We had to read stories. Some of the stories were really nice and fun and poems. Oh, I love to read poetry because I like to write poetry. But um, some of the stories were really kind of weird. But anyway, when I'd read these stories, they'd always be asking me, what do you think this guy was thinking when he wrote this? And I'm like, I don't know. I wish I could talk to this guy. You know, go up to him and go, hey, hey, Edgar Allan Poe, what in the world were you thinking? <laughs> Someday you'll figure that one out. He, he was weird, but anyway. Or uh, some of these poets that wrote such beautiful language, what were you thinking? And I got to thinking, you know, there are many times I'm reading my Bible and I'm thinking, what does this mean? Why did you put this in the Bible? But guess what? In Second Peter, we're told who the author of the Bible is. Do you know who the author of the Bible is? It says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The author of the Bible is God. And by way of the Holy Spirit, I can go and I can say, hey, God, please tell me, what did you mean? What did you want to tell me in this verse? I don't have to guess, do I? And I can go and I can ask and he will tell me because he wants me to understand. My dad always said that the Bible is God's love letter to us. Because in it, it tells about how much God loves us. Isn't that awesome? That God wrote us a love letter. And we can hold it in our hands and we can read it. And we can go ask him, what did you mean when you wrote that? And what does it have to do with my life today? Think about that this week. Thank you for listening. You may go back to your seats.
please stand with us again as we worship. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you.
Father God, I just praise you for this day and for the wet weather that nourishes everything and it's been such a beautiful, beautiful spring. All the pretty blossoms and dogwoods and red buds and we're just so blessed and thank you for this community, this church community and just be with each person here, Lord, and just fill each person here with your Holy Spirit and we pray especially for Doug as he, as he expresses his words, your words through him and we love you, Lord, and we just are blessed in so many ways. Amen. start here. Good morning, Compass. Thank you for that personal response. <laughs> I want s several of you, because when the time comes, peer pressure is hard to overcome, but to prepare your hearts to volunteer, because I'm going to ask for a volunteer a little bit later. So I just want you to start preparing your hearts now. Um, all you have to do is come up here and sit. Now, probably it would be best if you're wearing a skirt or a dress to not volunteer, so don't prepare your hearts. But anybody else, we're open. And all you have to do is come up here and sit. So just be ready for that. Thank you, Matt, for that prayer, but I want to start again with just a, a brief pause. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Lord, I truly do want your words to come through, so I pray that as I have put together some thoughts that it was the Holy Spirit that was speaking not only to me, but also to those of you who will hear what is said. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue throughout everything that I say to impress upon your hearts what you need to hear. In your name, amen. So we are in a series about the Holy Spirit, and we have reached the New Testament, and we are talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And one of those stories of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is Nicodemus's encounter with Jesus. Now, if you'll open your Bible in whatever form you may have, have it in, electronic or analog, I guess is what this is, to John 3. Oh, I've got a bookmark on purpose. To John 3. And I want you to notice the setting of what happens in John's gospel just before chapter 3. It's talking about Jesus clearing the temple. Now, I'm not going to go over that story, but you are probably familiar with it. If you're not, you can read it right there in John 2, starting verse 13. But that's the setting. That's what leads up to what is being told in John 3. So Nicodemus comes into the picture. Who is Nicodemus? Well, we know some things about Nicodemus. We know he was a member of the National Council of Israel, Sanhedrin. So if he was a member of that council, then there are several things we can assume to be true about him. He would have been respected. He would have been honored in Jewish society. He would have been highly educated, talented, and more than likely very wealthy. So this was Nicodemus. But somehow in his position of power, of authority, of respect, he was drawn to this person who did not exhibit any of these trappings of wealth or 
rulership that so many people aspired to, but he was this humble Galilean. But there is something there that Nicodemus was very interested in and finding more about. Now, Jesus had just stepped on the turf of the priests and rulers when he entered the temple and he cast out the money changers and the business that was going on there. Such boldness and usurping power really was not to be tolerated by the priests and rulers. But I imagine they had a little bit of fear of coming too hard, coming down too hard onto Jesus. And more than just because he was popular, they were scholars of Scripture. And they knew that prophets in the past had been sent by God, had been rejected by Israel, and there had been unfortunate consequences. They were not dumb. They knew that. They were a little cautious. They were probably not very anxious to really come outright yet against somebody who apparently seemed to have some power from God. So I imagine they were just a little bit fearful that they wouldn't fall quite yet into the same trap that history had done with the Jews before. Nicodemus would have been a student of Scripture. And he must have wondered, is this man the Messiah? But something doesn't quite fit with what I am reading in Scripture about the Messiah. And I would challenge you to read in the Old Testament about who the Messiah was going to be. And be honest with yourself if you might not have come to the same conclusions about getting rid of the Romans and being number one. So I wouldn't come down too hard on how maybe they interpreted what the Messiah was going to be, not, be like. So I'd like to read through our verses for today. They're in John 3, starting in, chap, in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. And I'm going to read through verse 21 so we can get the whole story and then we'll come back. So if you would read through with me, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to your mind as we're reading from the words that God wanted to leave for us. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these teachings? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, will not come into the light, for fear that their deeds will be exposed. 
But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that they have done, that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. There's no question Nicodemus wanted to keep his encounter with Jesus secret. Otherwise, why would he come at night? Now, there's something else that I think must be true as well. He would have had to put, into some, put some effort into finding out where Jesus was staying, what his habits were at night, when he might be able to be found alone. So Nicodemus was very intentional about meeting and talking with, with this Jesus. Now, why didn't he want it to be known? I don't know. Was he afraid of the condemnation of his peers? Afraid of what his friends might think? Afraid of what is, would happen to his reputation? Listen to Nicodemus's opening remarks. They would have made the human resources director proud. Verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. What a perfect example of a skilled communicator just smoothly paving the way for a mutually respective conversation. I'm going to share some, you're going to share some, we can dialogue a little bit. It's the perfect way to start a conversation. Jesus, however, saw right through the smooth words to Nicodemus' unbelief of him as the Messiah. Notice he said, we know you must have come from God, you're doing these things. But Jesus also saw a seeker for truth. Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He got right to the point. Verse 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now Nicodemus, he had come for a theological discussion. Something safe, something thoughtful, but not personal. But Jesus drove right to the heart of Nicodemus. In effect, I think Jesus was saying, it's not theoretical knowledge you need, Nicodemus, as much as it is spiritual regeneration. You don't need your curiosity satisfied, Nicodemus. You need a new mind. You have to receive a new life from God before you can appreciate heavenly things. And until this change takes place, it will result in no saving good for you to discuss with me my authority or my mission. You know, I think we're also like Nicodemus a lot of times. Would we rather verbally spar with someone, and I think there's a slide here, about the correctness of our beliefs instead of asking ourselves about the condition of our heart? Nicodemus was prepared to talk Bible, but I don't know if he was so prepared to talk about him. Because as a strict Pharisee, I'm sure Nicodemus was proud of his good works. And I'm sure he had good works. I imagine he was widely respected for his tax-deductible donations, for his time he spent at the temple, his dedication to the services. And I'm sure he was startled by the idea that God's kingdom was too pure for him to enter. Probably from having his pride wounded, he responded with just a little bit of sarcasm in verse 4. How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Come on, Jesus, let's get a little dialogue here. That was ridiculous. But Jesus, as he often, or I should say always, did, he didn't argue. 
he simply restated that Nicodemus needed to be changed. The Spirit was going to have to make him new. Verse 5 says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Our natural sinful mind is at war with God and his ways. Jesus was pointing out that there is absolutely no saving value in a legal religion. Our life can't be just a modification or improvement of how we act. It has to be a transformation of who we are. There has to be a death to who we were and a rebirth of a new inside person. Now, I think you probably have figured this out, but we can't do this. I cannot make a new inside person, and neither can you. Only the Holy Spirit can do this. So how does the Holy Spirit do it? I don't know. I'm suspicious you don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit does it either. And interestingly, I don't find Jesus explaining how the Holy Spirit does this. He just illustrates that it happens and that it is a real change. He uses the wind as his metaphor. He says you can't see it, but you certainly can see the changes that it brings. And it doesn't have to be a tornado to make a difference. There's something in physics called momentum. Now you probably are familiar with the word momentum. And you probably have an idea of what it means to have momentum. I mean, if you have momentum on a project, you've, you've gotten going. You're getting somewhere. Well, momentum is defined as mass times velocity. And after COVID, many of us are familiar with what mass is. Velocity has two aspects to it. It's not only speed, but it also is speed in a certain direction. I think that God wants us to have momentum in our spiritual life. In fact, I think we have to have momentum in our spiritual life to be a Christian. Now, momentum is mass times velocity. And there are several ways that you can have a lot of momentum. You can have a lot of mass and be moving very slowly. But you have a lot of momentum. I would like to, to imagine a dump truck filled with gravel. That's a lot of mass. And maybe this dump truck is just on a slight incline, and it's just slowly rolling, probably not faster than my hand is moving. But I would challenge you to go stand behind that dump truck and stop it. There's a lot of momentum there. It's not moving very fast, but there's a lot of momentum there. Now, you also could have very little mass and a lot of velocity. I would not challenge you to stand in front of a bullet, but a rifle bullet doesn't have a lot of mass, but it has a lot of velocity. There's a lot of momentum there. Don't try to stop that either. Now, you also could have a lot of mass and a lot of velocity. That would also provide a lot of momentum. And there are probably some good illustrations for that idea. But momentum, spiritual momentum. Now, interestingly, it does not take a lot of force to create a lot of momentum. You can create a lot of momentum with a very little amount of force if you're given enough time. If you let that force apply over a long period of time. Now I would love to start talking about impulse and change in momentum and kinetic energy, but we'll just start with that. If I just provide force, even a small amount, over a little bit, over a long amount of time, 
there's something called the solar winds. And when you want to propel a rocket to way out in our galaxy, you've got to have a, a lot of fuel if you're going to burn a rocket for a long time. But if you just open up this umbrella and let the solar winds, which are, you would never feel them. In fact, you're being bombarded by the solar winds, just particles from the sun all the time, and you can't see them or feel them. Or, but that tiny amount pushing will just keep a spacecraft going faster and faster and faster, particularly in a frictionless environment. Now, space is close to a frictionless environment. We don't live in a frictionless environment. When I was teaching physics, we always said, you know, well, if you take your frictionless environment and you apply this, we've got this formula that works real well, but we're always in friction. Now, I hope you, somebody has had their hearts prepared because I need my volunteer. And I saw a hand earlier, and that person can volunteer, or somebody else can volunteer. But come on up. I need a volunteer who's willing to sit. I'll do physics with you. Thank you. <laughs> Just make yourself comfortable on that. However, it see feet up. I'm not wide enough. <laughs> okay. Now, you can't touch the floor, but I would like you to have some momentum. <laughs> you don't appear to be going anywhere very well. You are moving. Well, not that way. To come to you? I didn't, I didn't say which way you wanted to come. I just said not that way. Where do you want me to go? You, <laughs> you, thank you, are mass. You are you in your spiritual life. I'm going to represent the Holy Spirit for just a moment. You don't have to do anything to generate momentum in your spiritual life. If you'll just spend some time in the Holy Spirit's presence, you may not even have known the direction the Holy Spirit wanted you to go. But you do have to have trust. But you do have to have trust, <laughs> which my brother-in-law always has of me. <laughs> there's a, Oops, there's a cord there. So if I spend enough time for the Holy Spirit, I can make a lot of progress. Thank you, you're a very good sport. I can make a lot of progress, but there's key. If Robert was not, if Mr. Fetters was not willing to come up here and sit down on this, he couldn't have even started to have pro progress. If he wasn't in the presence of the Holy Spirit, he can't have any spiritual progress. And then once he gets in the Holy Spirit, I mean, he can start moving and slide around a little bit, but he's not making any velocity, any speed in the direction he needs to be going because he doesn't even really know the direction he needs to be going. But the Holy Spirit does know the direction he needs to be going. I think our spiritual life is exactly like that. The same is true with the Holy Spirit. Time is the key. Spending time reading about Jesus, spending time listening to podcasts about Jesus, spending time watching videos about Jesus. This is how the Holy Spirit, in small, often imperceptible ways, can create a new heart in you. We become a changed person. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and fighting. Joy takes the place of sadness. The change comes when by faith we trust God enough to surrender ourselves to him. He mentioned trust. Absolutely right. We have to. Notice in the cleansing of the temple, 
the priests and rulers f fled from Jesus' presence. They were zealous for the appearance of holiness, in fact, sticklers for the letter of the law, but constantly violating its spirit. And when Jesus showed up, they weren't comfortable. They left. How about you and me? Would you be comfortable in Jesus' presence? Not from my goodness, and if you're honest with yourself, it's not from your goodness that would make you comfortable. But praise God, it isn't about us. It's about what God wants to do in our lives. It's through our belief in him that he can do that, that he can do what we need in order to enter heaven. Faith doesn't save us, but we can't, even we can't even have that without the Holy Spirit. We can't even repent without the Holy Spirit. We can't even have a desire to be with Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Here's how I believe it works. When we see how much God truly loves us by understanding who he is, in the submission of Jesus to die in the place of sinful you and me, then we are drawn to trust and surrender to him. Verse 16 of John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So here's what I think is the bottom line. Number one, our sinful minds can't be led into heaven. Number two, we have to have a new mind. Number three, we can't do it. Number four, the Holy Spirit can. Number five, there is effort in the Christian life. I want to say that again. There is effort in the Christian life, but it's not effort to change. It's commitment to time. And number six, the Holy Spirit will change us if we let him. So here's my appeal to you and to me. Live in the light of God's love. Spend enough time with him that the Holy Spirit can create in you a new mind. Your glory, God, is what I 
Help us to realize that it's your presence that we need to be in. I need to be in your presence every day. And you will make changes. I don't know how. And sometimes I may feel that it's not fast enough. But you are the one that knows the direction. You are the one with the wisdom that knows where to push, where to pull. Help me and help everyone here just to be willing to spend that time with you and be willing to trust you because we have caught a glimpse of how much you love us. Thank you so much for the direction and change you are more than capable and willing to do as we look forward to your coming. In your name, amen. <laughs>